are live. Hello to Laura Synthesis, who has already commented, um, saying, whoop, whoop, I was at both of these events too. And I've seen Motive in the queue and all. Brilliant. I wasn't, I certainly wasn't expecting someone to have gone to all three of these to be here uh, tonight. So thank you very much, Laura. I hope you stay for more of the stream. So, um, yes, I'm going to be discussing three events I went to recently. Well, one of them is a, a place, not really an event, but you know what I mean. So, the motive and the cue, the play about John Gilgood and Richard Burton, starring Johnny Flynn as Richard Burton and uh, Mark Gattis, which I think is how you say his name. <laughs> I still, I've been a fan for like a year, I'm still not sure. Uh, Mark Gattis as um, John Gilgood, as uh, John Gilgood, and um, a lot of synthesis says best play I've seen in ten years for real. Yeah, it was really brilliant play. It was very impactful. Um, yeah, it's an absolutely brilliant play. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about that, um, and I'm going to be talking about the BFI event where uh, I saw um, two episodes of Inside Number Nine early, um, and then I'm going to talk about uh, a comic strip presents event that I went to. Which was at uh, which is a, a series of events that Picture House Cinemas are doing. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you about the one I went to, um, and also I'm going to be telling you about which ones are coming up because um, uh, there weren't honestly there weren't that many people there, uh, which is a shame because especially because they're doing it, it probably had the biggest names. It had Jennifer Saunders uh, and Stephen Mangan there as as guests. Um, but um, but yeah, anyway, I'm going to tell you guys about that because uh, seriously, you guys are missing out. Um, I mean, if you haven't seen Comic Strip Presents in general, you're missing out. Um, so um, anyway, so yes. Um, if anyone else is here, they can also say hello. Ross says, yo! Hello, Ross. I don't know if that's Ross from the... Um, one of the many inside number nine discords I'm a, a member of. Um, he hasn't seen, have you still, if it is you, have you still not seen League of Gentlemen yet? <laughs> we had to explain to him why we were telling him to piss off. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, anyway, I've got a picture of Lon London, as Tubbs would say. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it, I, I love London. It's, I still feels like, um, I still feel like Tubbs when I go to London that I love that picture of uh Tubbs um the promo for the, the picture I think they did for the movie where she's out shopping it's in London it's very good um yeah I think I think he will might well be here uh I I always get excited when people say the new episodes from the BFI are really good but I'm skeptical lol um I mean you know it's fair enough if you feel skeptical I mean we're obviously all buzzing from seeing uh, Rhys Shearsmith and Steve Pemberton there and everything and obviously there were other guests uh, Jim Howick was there even though obviously he's not in that series he was in series 2 in Trial of Elizabeth Gadge um, and I S Susan Racoma that's her name I keep thinking of her as Rada because if you've, if you've seen her on Taskmaster uh, her nickname was Rada <laughs> uh, um, uh, so yeah um, I've still not seen oh I still, oh, I still haven't uh, not seen League of Gentlemen. I can only apologise. You know, what? fair enough. Um, I I will recommend going through their stuff backwards, like I did. So starting off with Inside Number Nine, then going on to Psychoville, then going on to League of Gentlemen, because then you descend backwards into the insanity. Um, I mean, seeing it, you know, the other way around, you know, chronologically, it's probably a, a more interesting way of seeing how they progressed. Um, but I think it's in order to. Uh, adjust to the weirdness. I think that helps. Um, uh, they were really good. The train one is excellent. Yes, absolutely. I thought they were both excellent, but yeah. Um, uh, so yeah. End of the League of Gentlemen radio shows. I haven't heard them yet. I've um, the reason I haven't is because I'm pla when I do listen to them, I want to make a video about them. I've already written and recorded a video comparing the Mighty Boosh radio show to the TV series. Obviously, the main difficulty of that is I then have to find footage. 
that does not exist to illustrate what I'm discussing. Um, I had this problem uh, for those of you who have seen my Bedlams and Broomsticks video. Uh, all three of you. <laughs> it didn't do very well. Um, I compared the book Bedlams and Broomsticks to the film and practically nothing that happens in the book happens in the film, which, you know, adaptation wise is really fascinating. Uh, editing wise, it's a pain in the ass. Um, so I'm having a similar problem with them. Um, I am having a similar problem with the... Um, uh, the mighty boosh which i am i am solving it's one of those things where i'm like i need to put this on the back burner because if i focus on this i won't be able to complete anything else so um i have if you go onto my kofi page um i don't know if it's one-time donations or just members for this one actually i, I think i ch changed it to anyone who donates rather than just members but i've posted um a sneak preview of um some prim primitive animation i attempted in canva to uh to illustrate some um, some scenes in the Mighty Boosh radio show. So that's there if uh, should uh, anyone be interested in the Mighty Boosh. But um, anyway, so I'm going to go through this chronologically. Uh, so yes, Motive and the Q. Uh, absolutely brilliant play. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know, it, um, uh, like I said earlier, it's about uh, Sir John Gilgood directing Richard Burton in a production of Hamlet, true story. Uh, in, it was in New York. It was when Richard Burton had just married Elizabeth Taylor. So in terms of his, um, he's at the height of his fame, both career wise and in terms of having quite a high profile personal life. Um and they don't get on. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of conflict between the two of them. Um, they both have a lot of professional respect for each other, but they get on each other's nerves. They're not looking for the same things in the performance. Um, and it's 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 about how they sort of eventually find that middle ground. Um, you know, these two, uh, you know, these these two great figures in acting. Um, and I'm definitely going to try and watch the uh, the actual production now because it has it was filmed at the time. It was 1962, I think, 1963, something something like that. Definitely early 60s. And uh, but yeah, it has been. It was recorded for film or television. So I am, um, and it wasn't like a film of it. It was it was literally they them filming the the stage production. Um, and the same has happened with Motive in the Queue. You can, I don't know if you can still watch it in cinemas, but it was recently released in cinemas. Um, if not, I imagine it'll probably end up on one of those um, sort of theatre themed streaming services that oh, popped up during the pandemic. Um, uh, so yeah, if uh, if anyone else has seen um, Motive in the Queue, feel free to share your um, what you thought in the comments. Um, I went with Anya, uh, who I know on Twitter. Uh, she's a, uh, a fellow Inside Number Nine and League of Gentlemen fan. We were just planning on meeting up in London, actually. And she was like, hey, well, we might as well. Are you up for going to this? We might as well while we're in London. I was like, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, um, got it from Today Tix, which are quite good for cheap tickets. They're much better if you get them on the day that you can get quite good deals. But, um, uh, but we did it in advance, which is obviously a lot more secure, especially if you want to see one show. Um, we were right up in the gods. Um, I can't remember what it's called, but like the top circle of seating um, we were in. But um, we had a great view um, and even the obscured seats. We made sure to get a seat that wasn't obscured. It was probably the it was still the cheap she seats, but it was a cheap seat that wasn't obscured. But I think if we... Um, if you were in an obscured seat, it wouldn't have been too bad, I don't think. It was um, so yeah, I ha had a really good view um, of everything, and um, it, yeah, it, it just really engaged me throughout. You know, um, uh, you know, it's obviously not a, a show that's heavy in, in spectacle in any way, but um, but you know, it's just wonderful witty dialogue. Uh, Sam Mendes, who directed 1917 and American Beauty, and 
Skyfall and Spectre, the two James Bond films, uh, and the stage version of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. He directed it. Um, uh, I wasn't sure where I I knew I saw when I saw Johnny Flynn, uh, especially when I saw him at the stage door, which I'll talk about in a minute. I'm like, yeah, I've seen. I don't know. Think I've seen you in something, but I've seen your face. Um, uh, if anyone remembers the um, uh, the Stardust uh, David Bowie biopic, the controversial one that came out a few years ago. That's the guy who plays David Bowie. And um, I haven't seen the film. I haven't heard good things about the film. Uh, I can't remember if they were... I mean, just the talk of the film in general was bad. So I don't know how many of those comments uh, pertain to his performance. But his performance as Burton was fantastic. I mean, especially in terms of the voice. You absolutely believed he was Richard Burton when he was on stage. Um, And of course, it's such an iconic voice. It's not easy to do um so yeah he did a really marvelous job um let's see what wasn't in the play was the fact that burton and o'toole flipped a coin on the set of beckett to decide who would be directed by gilgold in new york or olivier in london in hamlet ah that's interesting i've got um another of the 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 hell raises of uh, <laughs> acting there yeah, Peter O'Toole is particularly no- notorious, wasn't he? Ah, Ben Tamori! Oh, you haven't missed much. Um, uh, we've just been talking about uh, Motive in the Queue, the play that had Mark Gattis in. Uh, it's just finished, by the way, guys. It finished on the 23rd, so f- just a few days ago. Um, and I just want to say, Ben Zamori, uh 97, has very kindly made this wonderful new avatar of me that you see here. Um, so um yeah that's that's thanks to him um and uh let's see we've got another comment here ah brian damage hello yes i've I've finally seen the young ones so i know what that's from now (laughs) um and of course we'll be talking about um something from the young ones a lot in a minute um so yes hello there we will be talking about comic strip presents later um um Yeah, brilliant. Um, how could I not be glad, Ben? It was wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, so let me think. Of, do I have anything else to say about the play? It was about a month ago now that I saw it. Um, I don't really think I have anything else to say. It was a really fantastic show. Um, and um, I saw it at the Noel Coward. It started off at the National Theatre. So for those of you who don't know, um, obviously there's a West End, which is like our version of Broadway, where the most popular theatres are. Uh, the National Theatre is probably the most popular and esteemed theatre outside of the West End. It is in central London, but it's not in the same part of central London. Uh, it's right next to the British Film Institute, uh, actually, which obviously will be the the next story I talk about. And um, uh, and then probably after that's probably the Globe, but um, but yeah, it started there. They moved into the Noel Coward Theatre, which I believe they said at the end was where Gilgood did Hamlet. So it, you know, it's coming full circle. So that was um, really lovely. It's yeah, it's really wonderful show. Um, uh, I don't know if it'll go to Broadway, but um. If it does, it'll be very difficult to imagine people other than them in the cast, I'll be honest. Um, It'd be difficult to see people other than them doing such a good job. Um, I really like that they they kind it kind of went down. Obviously, there's the, the conflict between them, but it kind of got down into who they are and why they are the way they are. Um, and it was really, really lovely. Um Was there a standing ovation when you saw it? Um, there was when I saw it at the National early not early on. Uh, one of those where over a few minutes and more and more people stood up. Um, I don't think there was one that long, but I think it, I think yeah, I think there probably was a standing ovation at the end if if memory serves. Um, I went the same. So yeah, Anya and I were went to see the the matinee, um, and then um, uh, she put. Um, uh, mentioned it on Twitter and um, Alison from um, League of Gentlemen Charities. If you, if you don't know League Charities and you're a fan of League of Gentlemen, check them out because they auction off 
um, League of Gentlemen memorabilia that gets donated to them. Um, and they they sell it for um, uh, for charity. They auction it off. Um, as in fact, Alison posted the other day, it's very difficult for her to, <laughs> to have stuff auctioned off when, um, uh, and of course, she's such a big fan as well. But uh, they raise money that's you know close to the league and stuff. And um, like, what's that? That one Steve always raises money for. Steve Hampton always raises money for Dairy and House, whatever it's called. Um, uh, so yeah, and they were so yeah. We met up with them for a drink before and afterwards, and they were really, really lovely, absolutely lovely. Um, uh, bumped into them at the BFI, but didn't really get the chance to chat. Um, but yeah, they're all all really lovely. I hope I get to see them again. Uh, so yeah, we went to the stage door. Um, I uh, bought my local book. I want I bought a program as well, but I wanted something league for Mark to sign. So um I uh I uh Johnny Flynn came out first and I got an autograph from him. Um and um uh on the, the program and then uh, Mark Gattis came out and um <laughs> there's this there was a I think it was a lads mag uh so like a, a ladies in bikinis kind of magazine that um, the League of Gentlemen did a photo shoot for to promote the movie. It's one of those things that is kind of fascinating because it's one of those what the hell marketing decisions. And uh, <laughs> Anya bought it so that she could have it signed by him. And he just took one look at it and went, oh, the, that was the worst day of my life. Tiny signature for you. <laughs> She's got a picture of it on... Um, uh it'll, it'll be on twitter but it's on her instagram as well but because it obviously it'll be take quite a while to go back through um her tweets but um uh but yeah um uh got a selfie with him as well it's really 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 lovely and um um so yeah i think that is pretty much that for talk about motive in the queue if anyone else has any questions about motive in the queue or they've got uh something to share about their own experiences they can share that now um so like i said you can check it out i don't know if it's in cinemas but i imagine that it'll be released on one of those sort of theater streaming services at some point i know there's there's still a few around aren't they there one or two um anyway Let's go to. I think I'll move on to the next one now. Feel free to still comment about it. Oh yeah, there's a picture of them. I, sh I should show more than one picture when I'm talking about these things. So yeah, there we go. It's a very very good show. Um, so let's talk about inside number nine. Um, oh, and I've got nine people viewing. Perfect. So um, so yeah. Um, I at first I didn't get a ticket. So um. The way it works is at the, at the British Film Institute every year. Um, it's a centre that's kind of like um, it's kind of a a library, like an academic library for people studying film, and they've got archives you can watch there at the BFI. But they also do events like this. They do advanced screenings of uh, films and TV shows, or screenings of older films as as part of celebration. Like they did a John Barry celebration where they showed some old James Bond films to celebrate the composer's work. Um, but anyway, every year uh, for Inside Number Nine, they've done a screening at the BFI, an advanced screening showing um, episodes of the next series. And um, uh, so I found out when the tickets were going to go on sale. I set an alarm on my phone. Um, it was going to be on one of my days off that the tickets were going to, supposed to go on sale. So I was like, right, uh, it's perfect. I'll be able to get there the moment they got on sale. Um, and they all sold out two days before it went on sale. <laughs> so apparently every year they've always sold out during the members only pre-sales. I did not know this, so I didn't get a, a membership. I think there were, there were plenty of people who got a membership just so that they could get the members only pre-sales for that. So that was really disappointing. But like, I was really, I was really happy for all of my mutuals who were going. I was really excited for them. You know, I was, I was disappointed, but I was really excited for them. Um, I was sort of humming and hiring of whether I should, you know, go and see if there's a standby ticket on the day. Um, but I was trying to be like, I, I should put my hopes up. Um, ah, you clever bugger. 
yeah, that's um, yeah. If only I'd I'd got got that, then I would have got the ticket in the first place. But anyway, the most important thing is I did get a ticket because Vienna is a member. Vienna's um, someone else I know through Twitter, and um, uh, she um posted saying, "Oh, a friend dropped out. Does anyone want a ticket?" And literally about like eight or nine minutes after she sent that, Anya messaged me that tweet and went quick get it so um i dm'd vienna and um uh paid her the um the amount she paid for the ticket and um uh yeah so i don't know if you're watching vienna but thank you so much for that actually i don't think i tweeted to say that i'm live let me check oh well i am live on twitter (laughs) I, I forget that live things on Twitter are a thing. I can do that through um, StreamYard. So I'll just send out a tweet. So yeah, I had a Tubbs-esque day wandering around London, going around Camden, that sort of thing. And then I met up with um, um, with Anya and um, had a really, really lovely time. Um, and yeah, and I, I, it was just so nice chatting to you guys who were there. It was everyone was really, really lovely. Um, actually, Laura, was I was I chatting to you? I can't remember the names of the people I met. I know there was a lot of. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know, Anya has um, she's very active on social media, and she um, uh, until recently she had a bright she dyed her fringe bright red, so um, so she's very easy to spot. <laughs> um so it has she had some people come over and like oh I, I think i follow you on tumblr or facebook or whatever it was so um uh yes yes that was me that was me um uh so yeah um uh yeah i, I remember i remember who you are because i remember you saying that you were going to go so yeah uh, yeah, I, I didn't notice you at uh, spot you at the the BFI, but um, uh, so sorry about that. Um, but anyway, um, so yeah, back to the BFI. So yeah, all of you guys who I met were absolutely lovely, um, and I was one of the things I was most excited about was seeing you guys, um, and um, of course I don't I don't show my face, so I had to <laughs> I had to introduce myself as Enchanted Essays. <laughs> And they were suddenly like, "Oh, hello!" <laughs> uh, Jackson gave me a big hug as soon as, as soon as he saw me. Bless him. And um, so, um, so yeah, uh, so yeah, we went in. Um, they um, this was the screening room. Unless they have an identical screening room, this was the screening room we went to. As you can see, not massive, just like a. Um, a regular cinema screening room, you know, not that big. Um, and um, uh, and this is this is this is the side of the room I was on. This isn't my picture. This is a picture from. Um, I take very few pictures myself of things. I'm just not in the habit of taking pictures when I'm at places, which uh, I need to get into the better into the habit of. Um. Uh yes, I think that was Vienna who I got the ticket off. Yes, she was great. Um and uh the, um pretty much all of inside number nine Twitter are goths. <laughs> I was I was wearing a, a sort of gothy dress, so I I sort of blended in. But yes, we were like a little coven of inside number nine fans and <laughs> yeah, you know, it felt it felt really special. Um Yeah, is it? Oh. Well, obviously, there's. I know there's an IMAX there, but that wouldn't be counted as a screening room, would it? 
So I, ma- I imagine that's bigger, but I don't know. I, ha- I haven't been to a um, uh, an IMAX since I went to the um, Science Museum as a kid. It's the only thing I've seen in an IMAX is, you know, nature documentaries. <laughs> I imagine seeing a, uh, an action film or something is a, in one is uh, far more exciting. Not that, that they're bad at the ones at the science museum; those are always a lot of fun. Um, yeah, yeah, probably. <gasps> oh, you lucky bugger! Oh wow! Uh, I was on the same. Well, as you saw, I was on the same row at the um, uh, comic strip thing as 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 the guests. So that was nice. Um and um so um anyway uh so yeah the guy who you'll have seen in the other BFI uh videos they do because they put they put up the interviews uh I think with all of them I, that they do they definitely did it for the deadline one because as you Sorry, I uh, accidentally unplugged my mic- microphone. Hopefully, if you're watching this, you're, uh, you'll already know. But I made a video essay on Deadline. Um, and it's the only episode of Inside Number Nine I've seen more than twice. I haven't even seen all of the episodes of Inside Number Nine yet. I, um, because I've been trying to pace myself. I like watching the show with people so I can sort of digest it and discuss it. And because it gives you so much to think about. You should just, I've, I've, I, um, I did it uh, in the run-up to the BFI because I was like, oh, God, stuff's going to get spoiled for me of other episodes. So I ended up watching more but um, uh, and getting quite a few out of the way. Um, so I've seen most of them now. But, yeah, I, I, I like to pace myself with them because I get so I get so much to think about afterwards. I find uh, two new episodes a night like, quite difficult. So, um um uh, So, anyway. So, yeah, the guy who interviews them every year works for the BFI – and he was um, saying at the beginning that that screening room was being renovated the next day. So this was the last possible day that they were going to be able to do a screening at the BFI um, like they did every year. And um, he's saying I had to be purposely vague on the website because I didn't know if we were going to have any full episodes. I thought we might just have to show a a clip compilation or something. Um, But thankfully... They finished two full episodes. Um, uh, so, yeah, one one they literally made a change to editing in the edit to that morning. So um, the edit will be slightly different when we see it on TV. I don't imagine it was a major edit. I imagine it was just something like using a different angle or a different reaction shot. Like a, I imagine it was a minor edit like that. I don't imagine that it was like... A, any lines of dialogue cut from it. I may be wrong. I don't know. Uh, I, I'm not. I'm not them. So, <laughs> but um, but anyway. So yeah, we watched the episodes and yeah, like like Ross said, you know, if you're if you're skeptical, you know, fair enough. But because obviously we were all on an adrenaline adrenaline high, but absolutely brilliant, absolutely absolutely brilliant, both of them. I'm not going to give anything away about both either of them. Um, one episode did take place in public transport, but I'm going to leave it at that. But um, but yeah, some of the best stuff I've ever seen from Inside Number Nine. Um, and um, I'm going to I'm I'm honestly I can't wait until May when I can, you know, talk to you guys about it. Um, uh, actually, let me know in the in the comments if you'd like me to do like live streams afterwards about that. Because I'll probably be up for that, really. Like, uh, like the ones I did with, if you saw the Christmas ones I did, I did some of about the League of Gentlemen Christmas stuff and uh, the Inside Number Nine Christmas specials. If you want me to, do, if you want to see me do something like that for um, for the final, se- the ninth and final series of Inside Number Nine, then we can do that. Um, so yeah, um, yeah. Where do I start? Uh, <laughs> so yeah, it's I, I I really enjoyed both of them. Um, they got a lot of laughs out of me. They got a lot of gasps out of me. You know, don't know what else to say really. But yeah, absolute absolutely brilliant. Um, I don't think you guys will be disappointed with either of them. Um, but then again, you know, people are 
very subjective. I mean, there's, I, I mean, just look at sardines. That's either, it's usually the, the top or at the bottom of people's lists if people do lists. I can't rank inside number nine. It, it's too, it's too high quality and too varied for me. Um, but, um, but yeah, absolutely. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. So then there was the Q&A. Um, so I did see some people on Reddit complaining about the Q&A afterwards because there were some people who were asking questions that people thought were stupid questions. Um, and it's just, just let fans be fans, I think. It's just like, if you find someone a bit cringe or a bit annoying, just like, I don't see why people have a problem with that. There are plenty of things that fans do, that pe people, things that, you know, people who I'm mutuals with do, or, which I personally like not a fan of but they're not anything harmful they're just their way of expressing their love for something and if someone's expressing their love for something like what's the harm in that um but um i so hope the inside 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 number nine podcast comes back this time yeah i haven't even heard the podcast but i i want it to come back i don't think it will because i think um I, I think it was like a, a comment I read sort of someone quoting an interview. So I don't know if it's a certain, but apparently we said, oh, we, we decided to stop it because we felt it was giving too much away, which, you know, fair enough. But I mean, it's, it's, um, it's disappointing, especially if you're someone like me, who's really curious about that side of things. Um, but, you know, fair enough. If, if it frees them up to spend more time doing other things. I would have preferred better questions, to be honest. There's loads of time for questions. I don't mind some daft ones when it's limited, but when it's limited time. Yeah, yeah, I know I know what you mean. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I do feel for people who had questions that they wanted to ask when I went to... I was considering asking a question, but I didn't in the end. Um, I was too scared of making them angry at me. <laughs> I didn't want I didn't want to be the one they were bitched about on Richard Herring and <laughs> in a year's time. Um but seriously, um I, I yeah, I I I get what you mean. I, I when there's not a lot, lot amount of time then I I get it. But uh but like I understand people wanting to just ask what they what they want to ask, but yeah, I I I do agree with you, Laura. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm guessing you you're saying that about <laughs> About not, not wanting them to be angry with me. Yeah. <laughs> I I would I would die on the inside. But one person asked, um, they said, uh, Reese, uh, I have you learnt to drive? Uh, which is like a silly question. I can understand why it would be a burning question for someone. Uh, because also, you know, if he doesn't know how to drive, how does he you know drive in shows? You know, um, uh, in fact, in League of Gentlemen's Apocalypse, when he's uh, Jeff in the first scene, you know, you see Jeff. Um, you can actually see in the background the person who was pushing the car. <laughs> so you know, I, I, I uh, that could have ended up uh, talking about that. But yeah, she was like, "Oh, I know it's a stupid question, but Reese, have you learnt to drive?" And he said, "Yes, that was a stupid question." So, um, <laughs> but you know. Um, uh, Steve did did mouth that he still hasn't learned to drive, so that you know, that solved uh, that's that answered that question. Um, I had a Spanish question I was dying to ask, but was holding myself back. Lol. Yeah, um, I can't. Remember, let me think what my questions were. I think it was. Um, uh, I was thinking uh, there were two. Uh, one of them I remember was what was the worst question you've ever had? Because then they couldn't be angry with me. They were then angry with whoever asked the worst question they'd ever had. <laughs> um, I don't know. It was one that was, you know, more related to the show, but I can't remember what it was. Um, um, but yeah, I know the, the feeling of not getting it, it to answer your question because I went to a... Um, Oh, what was I going to say? Uh, I went to uh, one of the Garth Marenghi things and didn't get to answer my question. My dad asked the question because I went to that with my dad, and um, I can't remember what it was, but it was it was a it was a question that that you, you 
we thought oh, a lot of people have, have, have uh, will have asked that uh it was like it was, it was a good question it wasn't it just wouldn't have been a very original one and i had i did have uh, an original one but i didn't put my hand up until about halfway through the question and answer session and it was a very long question and answer session for um for that one because it was about about a third of the show was question and answer the first half of the garth Marenghi show was him reading extracts from the book the second half was a q and a and part of them was him um interviewing himself with a tape recorder and then the other half was him uh, asking the audience questions so it did take up more of the show but um but it was i was, I was going to ask him because of course uh matthew holness is in character as this bad horror writer goth Marenghi, and i'd just seen the spin-off series which i released a review of um and i forgot to turn off all the audio on the video clips that i was using in the background so it was a mess so i've deleted it and i'm re-uploading it this friday um because it's a lesson in how i need to pace myself uh and shouldn't rush myself um but anyway so yeah i'd i'd, I'd made up a question about that i was like was um uh was war of the wasps too revolutionary and that is that why it hasn't had a criterion release or something like that um but um uh so yeah anyway back back to the bfi um so yeah it was really wonderful and it's just really wonderful atmosphere and they thanked people who'd worked on the show um people who are in the audience like christian henson their composer and i can't remember her name but the woman who'd done uh who was like the casting director for all of them they thanked and it was really really lovely it was really warm wonderful atmosphere um so yeah then people left um i uh i said hello to um elizabeth i can't remember her surname um she's a japanese artist um who uh Rishi smith reposts her work quite a lot she does these incredible artworks of uh inside number nine characters and um she put a message on, on twitter saying oh i'll be in a kimono say hello to me so i went to said hello to her because vienna had gone to say hello to her but anyway so yeah then i met up with about the other half of people that uh anya and i knew through twitter and it was really really lovely to meet everyone and then we went to um, uh, went right. We'll we'll see if we can get a selfie or an autograph. So we went round the side, um, and um, what they'd done, and we we went kind of last because we we were meeting up with each other, um, sort of in the foyer. And uh, what they'd done is they'd fenced off. You know those those things used to fence off queues. They had one of those, and they fenced us off. Uh, you know those. Those bits by the stairs. There's a bit by the staircase in one of these um, kind of buildings. That's always completely vacant. It was one of those little bits that, that they cordoned us off in. And they said, the security said, right, if you want a cell phone autograph, you have to go in the pen. They themselves called it the pen. Um, uh, so many... Uh, behind the scenes folks in the audience yeah it was a lovely night for the inside number nine family yeah yeah it was really lovely for them um it, it, yeah it was yeah it was it's just you, you kind of felt really happy for all of them because they must have felt so proud of all the wonderful stuff that they'd done um so again it's an end of the an era for um especially for you know people working behind the scenes who'd worked on because obviously the actors only really uh, apart from uh shifts with the Med Pemberton themselves they only work in on one episode but um but yeah for the crew who'd been working on it for years it must have been a, a really emotional night for them um so anyway so yeah we went so we went into the pen but because we'd arrived last we ended up sort of going to the back of it um only see Pemberton came out for photographs um Quinn who I know from Twitter and YouTube and those other places um she went yeah this happens every year he comes out and does the autographs and photos so so Reese can sneak off and you I I think that's absolutely fine um uh especially because when someone heard that Reese was at the bar they're like quick get out <laughs> and I'm like well just 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 leave him be if he doesn't want to be like if, if if he doesn't want like if you if 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 you are a person who did go back out because he was there like I can't blame you but at the same time, you know, if someone, 
I'm I'm very self conscious of when I'm saying hello to someone and asking for an autograph and a selfie. I'm encroaching on their time. You know, I'm. <sighs> It, you know, it's, it's hard to tell because, you know, it, it probably means something nice to them, but it probably means more to you than it does to them. Or it might do, it might not do. I don't know. But uh, I'm sure it very much depends on the person. But I've, I've as, as, especially going back to Motive in the Queue, I, I felt bad for Mark Gattis when I went back just as he was about to leave to ask for if I could have a selfie as well um, because I was, I was quite shy. So I, I just asked for an autograph the first time and then I went and asked him for a selfie. But it was just as he was about to leave. And I was like, oh, the poor guy. Because it was after the matinee, he's not got that long to you know grab some dinner before the next show. So, so yeah, I, I always feel like oh, I'm I'm encroaching on their time. I don't want to, I don't want to bother them. Um, but yeah, anyway. Uh, so yeah, I um, uh, so yeah, Steve Pemberton came around, did autographs and pictures. Um, but because we were all at the back, none of us managed to to get one because um. He left. He wasn't there for very long. Uh, just enough time, I imagine, for um, for Rishi Smith to leg it. But um, uh, but yeah, really, really wonderful. Um, he was, you know, it's it nice to see him there, and he seemed very friendly. And um, then he went off, and um, so I didn't. I managed to take. I forgot to add it to my slideshow, but I managed to take one terrible picture of him i'm always terrible at taking pictures um it was a, i mean it was he was waving goodbye and he's on his way off so it was going to be blurry anyway but i am i am catastrophically awful at taking pictures like i said I, i'm not in the habit of taking them in the first place so um and i haven't had a smartphone for that long compared to other people so um i just haven't got round to becoming competent at it <laughs> So yeah, that was um so I had a really um a really nice time doing that. And um um so yeah, it's any um oh uh so cool that BFI had left out that cheese and crackers cut out for us. I didn't manage to see that. I only saw the pictures of it afterwards, but yes, that was uh wonderful. Um Alison from League Charities had posted pictures of it I saw. Um. Yeah. So, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's the the characters they played in um, Bernie Clifton's dressing room, which is about a double act. So, um, uh, so it's it's definitely one. It's like it's not not about them, but it's something that people sort of associate quite heavily with with them in terms of oh. No entrances. Does does this look better, guys, or the other one? This one you can't see me at all, can you? I mean, not that you can see me anyway. It's just like my little picture. But um, I might as well keep it. This is only me for today. So yes, if uh, anyone else wants to comment about the the BFI, they can. Um, Bernie Clifton is a lot of people's favorite episode, indeed. I I, I can certainly see why. That's one of the ones that I rushed to watch before um before I I saw it. Uh, the the BFI because I'm like uh, right. I need to watch the uh, the greatest hits, as it were. Um, um, so I watched that, um, and the people once that people had spoiled for me already. So stakeouts, everyone is spoiling stakeout. I I understand why, but like if if you're watching this and you're not really in, you've only just started watching Inside Number Nine. Watch stakeout before the internet ruins it for you. It is it is a genius episode every way, either way, and it is fantastic. Um, showed it to my dad, and he went good twist when it happened um, because it is a really genius episode. So yeah, do do definitely watch it if you're a fan as soon as possible um, before it gets spoiled for you, um, including me. Or oh, had you spoiled it as well, <laughs> or oh, had it already been spoiled for you? Um, but yeah, um, let me think. What other um uh, misdirection it was quinn's it's quinn's favorite episode um uh, so i was like right i'm gonna watch misdirection uh, oh series eight i knew lo lots of people people were more likely to ask questions about series eight so i saw that the only ones i'd seen of series eight um i'd only seen three by three uh i think 
Yeah, I'm pretty sure I'd only seen three by three because um, that was uh, because when I first saw Inside Number Nine, I started you know watching it chronologically as a lot of people do with streaming. Well, the thing I love about it is that you can watch them randomly. I used to be in a Discord server that would watch them randomly every week, and that's kind of died out now. But I I miss that way of encountering episodes, just seeing them completely randomly. Um, but um, but I don't. It, if you watch them chronologically, you know, either is fine. Uh, but yeah, I watched Sardines, which did really impress me as an episode. Um, and then 3x3 three three happened, and I was like, I I read about it. It, it came up as news on my phone. Um, it didn't spoil the twist for me, which um, a lot of, pe- a lot of um, news outlets spoiled because... I'm not going to spoil it now, but, you know, if you put something in inverted commas, you can put anything in a headline, basically, you know. So you could say something happened when it ha- happened in the context of the show, but it makes it sound like it happened for real, you know, that clickbait kind of stuff. So thankfully I didn't see those headlines until after I saw the episode. But as soon as I got home, this is like a couple of days later after I'd seen Sardines, I was like, I need to watch this. And... Um, didn't disappoint three by three. I know a lot of other people don't like it. A lot of people compare it to Deadline and um, prefer Deadline. Uh, I think that's a bit unfair, to be honest. It was another. Um, it was another prank one, which so I get people preferring um, three by three. I mean, preferring Deadline out of the two of them. But the way the way in which they do they achieve what they do is very different. And I was I was just so imp- so impressed by I mean now I I know how much Lee Mac you know changed himself. They said they basically said to him you know improvise as much as you want as the way you would react to these things if you were hosting the show. But Lee Mac because I'd I've seen Would I Lie to You so many times. I've seen it for over ten years now. Certainly 10, 15 years I've been watching that show. So to watch him acting and i haven't seen much of not going out so, so just just seeing him just acting reacting so naturally to what was going on just it it and in his own voice it, it kind of it sort of sucked me in i think that's what, what sucked me in really um but yeah anyway so i made sure i watched everything else in series eight which i hadn't got around to um last weekend also had been spoiled for me um you know, usually the fandom is is quite good at that, but um, at trying to keep things secret. But I mean, it's difficult. <laughs> I mean, when there's a joke to be made, there's a joke to be made. You know, um, I've started doing it about steak out as well. <laughs> I mean, you know, just quote tweeting things saying Varney. <laughs> so not massively spoiling things, but you know. Anyway, Comic Strip Presents. So, um, Laura, I know obviously you know what Comic Strip Presents is. Um, but if anyone else is in the, the comments, you haven't had any comments from anyone in a while, um, from anybody else, um, feel free to write if you are familiar with Comic Strip Presents. Um, I imagine a lot of you won't be, but um, but yeah, please, please, please do. Because um, I'm really, really curious. Um, the hype. Yes. <laughs> um so um so yeah it was um so for those of you who don't know Comic Strip Presents was a comedy anthology series that aired in the um it started out in the 80s um and then sort of aired there was this sort of uh sporadic series and um specials and even feature films throughout the 80s and 90s. And there have been, I'm not sh- sure because I haven't seen very much of the latest stuff, but about four, I think, four or five specials um, since the year 2000. They've definitely, they've made far fewer of them. Um, oh, um, I didn't, I didn't know that Red, um, uh, Red Richardson was there, so uh, I mean I was at like the other end, so I wasn't that close to them. Um, 
I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if they're there. For those of you who don't know, um, Red Richardson is the uh, is the son of Peter Richardson, who is the one who um, produced and produced the show and is in every episode um, because he's also an, an actor and writer, and he ended up directing quite a lot of them. He probably has more directing credits than anyone else on the show. Um, Red was there for the first show, White Hoodie. Yeah, I don't know because I, I don't really know what he looks like. I know he works as a comedian. And uh, he married Rosie that she was referring to is Rosie Mayall, isn't it? He married uh, Rick Mayall's daughter. I suppose they, they would have been childhood friends because I think they lived next to each other, didn't they? Uh, the Richardsons and the Mayalls. So, um, so anyway, so in terms of what it's like, I mean, comparing to Inside Number Nine is quite different. Different. It's definitely a, it's a comedy anthology series, um, but um, rather than uh, a thriller. Um, uh, but um, so yeah, lots of faces here that you'll recognise. So um, there were plenty of you know guest stars and stuff within the show, but these were the main cast. Um, the ones that would appear in the show the most. So what the comic strip originally was, um, and actually if I recommend watching the comic strip uh, 1981 short film to get an idea of where they started off, was um, it was they started off as comedians at the comedy stall, uh, a store, and um, by them I mean um, Peter Richardson, who you can see there on the... You guys can't see my mouse, can you? Uh, the guy who's there on... <laughs> yeah the gang it's i love this photo shoot so much i'd love to know what it was for because i've seen at least two pictures in this photo shoot and it's ah, oh, it's so lovely seeing them all together and there's there is this, this this feeling of camaraderie that you as you watch the show where you're like oh they're writing all this stuff for each other and and as they became more famous and they weren't in each other's stuff as much um you don't get that as much they i think it does get um better uh, oh, thanks. Yeah, uh, Laura just told me can't see my mouse, but um, but um, but you know, I think the 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 stories and so to a certain extent, the comedy gets better later on. But earlier on, it's not as good. I'd say it's ve not very plot heavy at all. Uh, the first series, which I've almost finished writing a ranking of, so I will I will rank it. Um, Comic strip presents. Um. But um, so yeah, Peter Richardson, the one who uh, wrote uh, and directed a lot of them, um, as well as being the producer, he's the one on the. You can sort of see half his face is cut off there. He's the one on the far left there, uh, and the next to him is um, underneath him uh, at the bottom there is Alexi Sale. He was um, sort of the the MC at the club, so he'd he was a stand up and he would introduce each act. You'll, if you've seen the young ones, you'll uh, recognise him as um, uh, the landlord, and he plays a different character in every episode, pretty much, um, who is somehow related to the landlord. Um, and he's, uh, and you know, his, his, his stand-up, from what I've seen, is, is very similar to the stuff he would do on the young ones, where he'd uh, get a minute to the, the camera. Uh, and then above him, if you've seen the young ones again, you'll recognise that's Nigel Planer, who plays Neil. Um uh and then above him uh Adrian Edmondson who um you uh you'll if actually if you've seen bottom you probably won't recognize him here he looks so different when he doesn't have a shaved head <laughs> um and um but yeah he's best known for being the comedy partner of Rick Mail over here um I think he's he's just as good, and he does write and direct. I mean, he d does uh, co-write some episodes and write his uh, some episodes by himself. But um, the episodes that he, the stuff that I've seen so far that he wrote, and the stuff he directed as well, which he only directed two episodes, I think. Um, Private Enterprise and More Bad News. It's yeah, you know, some of my favorite stuff in the show. Um, so yeah, I think he, I think he's wonderful. I think he's. Um, it's one of those things where it's kind of like yeah, it's, it's it's kind of it's rated, but it's kind of underrated, which I feel about the whole show, um, and I feel about the cast for everyone except Rick Mail. Um, not that I think Rick Mail is overrated. Rick Mail a hundred percent earned the 
the acclaim that he got a hundred percent. Um, I think it's a shame that he overshadows the rest of them in terms of reputation. Um, uh, AIDS won awards for um music video direction as well. Yes, that he did a um. I recommend watching the clip of him on Graham Norton, which you may have already seen. Uh, may, that may be how you found it out. But he told, um, he was telling a story about when he was in America um, picking up an MTV award. And he said, I've won awards for, I've won awards for music videos. I've won awards for vegetables. I've never won an award for comedy. I was like, aww. <laughs> Someone make him an award for comedy. Someone spray paint a frying pan gold or something. <laughs> Maybe I should do that. Maybe I should spray paint a frying pan gold and send it to him <laughs> as an award for comedy that he deserved and never got. Um, but anyway, yeah, um, I do think he's. I, I do. I do think pretty much all of them don't get the acclaim they deserve. I mean, you know, even like Nigel Planer is is a very well recognised because of what he did in the Young Ones. Oh, by the way, um, Adrian Edmondson is the one in the Young Ones who played Vivian. Uh, the punk, which um, again, he's pretty unrecognizable because he's pulling that one facial expression as Vivian. I'm not saying one facial expression is to like to as a negative thing, as a positive thing. It's he's um, makes him unrecognizable as Vivian. It's it's brilliant. But anyway, um, like Nigel Planer, I feel from what I've seen, I think he kind of got. I think his stuff, his solo stuff, as deal is brilliant. And uh, whilst he didn't write the the young ones, Neil was a character he created. So I think you know he got the most out of that character and then retired it. And uh, I think that was absolutely the right thing to do. But I think I think unfortunately he's kind of become known as Neil in the public when he's he's Nigel Payne is an actor that has fantastic range. Um, actually, I went to see. Um, I'm sorry, Nigel Planer has a Patreon. Why did no one tell me of this? Oh, that's brilliant. I'm signing up to that. Wonderful. I know there's a, there's a, a YouTube channel that posts old videos of his that I think is his. But yeah, that's, that's wonderful. I'm definitely checking that out. Um... What? Alexi has a Patreon. You are kidding me. R.I.P. my bank account. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Um, well, uh, what I was going to say is I seen Nigel Planer twice, but it was before I was a fan of him, which of course doesn't have the same impact, does it? I saw him once at a, a book festival, and I saw him, I uh, saw him and Adrian Edmondson in that play they did, Vulcan Seven. Uh, not because I was a fan, and the audience was full of fans because there's a and A session afterwards. And they were just asking about the young ones. And I did feel kind of sorry for them. Because it's not that they didn't like talking about the young ones. You know, it's, it's, I think it's, it's something they're very proud of. And it's something they'll be associated with forever. But I think it's a shame that no one was asking questions about the play they'd just performed in and written. But, um, but then again, maybe if it was me now, after I've seen the young ones and the comic strip and stuff, I'd probably ask, I'd probably ask at least about the comic strip. <laughs> But anyway, um, yeah, they did a play together called Vulcan Se Seven. Um, it's three people in the cast, and it was pretty much a two-hander. It was really brilliant. Um, ah, uh, Alexi's uh, Patreon at is attached to Alexi's podcast, which is uh, excellent. I didn't know he had a podcast either. I'm I'm still quite new to this uh, to this fandom. Um, by the way, I am um, the mod of the Comic Strips Presents subreddit. It had um, closed down, which is what happens with the subreddit if um, if it, the user who's moderating it is inactive. Um, but I managed to to get it uh, back, so it's it's now open, and so people can post on there. It is pretty much just me posting on there for the minute, but there are still people who um, who were on there. Um... Anyway, um... so yeah, that play was very good. I. I it was a really wonderful play um uh very very funny and quite heartfelt at times um laura um is, you could uh did you get to see um vulcan 7 I, I i was very good so yeah i i went to see it like not not because of them and i probably was one of the my boyfriend and i were probably the only people in the audience who weren't there because of them 
Um, I saw the recast version of the play and absolutely loved it. I didn't know there was a recast version. That's interesting because, you know, it was a play written for them. So that would be interesting. Obviously, I know they had un they would have had understudies. Um, but yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, so anyway, moving on, talking about the cast. Everyone here is going to recognise Robbie Coltrane. Um, I know a lot of people here are my age, so they'll know him as Hagrid. But he's had a wonderful uh, television career either way. Um, uh, it's headed straight for us, Park Theatre. The younger cast had an, so had an additional surprise martial arts bit. So was it the same play as um, Vulcan 7 then, but just with a different title and reworked for, for different people? But um, but anyway, um, going back to Robbie Coltrane, um, I highly recommend a yes, yeah, uh, same play, yeah. Uh, to, going back to Robbie Coltrane, there's a fantastic drama series he did. It's on iPlayer. It's kind of what made him. It's what made him a, sort of a big name. Uh, it's called Tutti Frutti. He plays this guy who's um, uh, he's got a brother who's about ten years older than him that die who dies and um. He's in this uh, rock and roll band, this sort of aging one hit wonder Glaswegian rock and roll band. Um, so he uh, he has to join them so that they can reunite for their um, 20th anniversary tour. And it's this, it's this lovely little drama comedy. And um, what's her name? Emma Thompson's in it as well as, as his love interest. And she, she does a good job with the accent. The rest are all from Glasgow, the rest of the cast. Um, and that that fellow from One Foot in the Grave, he's in it as well. Um, but anyway, uh, so yeah, he, this was kind of this would have. I'm not sure. I think this would have been a few years earlier. So uh, when he this show started, so it's kind of what first or people probably would have first recognised him in because um, he was he he wasn't a part of the main cast. The main cast. The core cast, I'd say, was uh, Adrian Edmondson and Rick Mail, French and Sa French and Saunders, um, and then Nigel Planer and um, Peter Richardson. Those three double acts, who were the three double acts who'd be on um, at this comic strip nightclub, they were the core cast of the show um, for series one and two, and um, most of them were in every episode for series one and two, um, and then they became more famous and did other things obviously French and Saunders and had, went and had their own shows um, Rick Mail would have had the New Statesman around the time of series three I think um, but yeah anyway um, uh, so yeah French and Saunders started out in this um, who you'll recognise from French and Saunders. Um, for people outside the UK, um, they were in Coraline. They were the two old ladies in Coraline, I believe. And Jennifer Saunders was also the fairy godmother in Shrek 2. Um, and then finally, you've got Keith Allen, who came into the show uh, later than the others. He was just an actor who then ended up sort of becoming associated with them. In fact, one of the episode specials they did, he asked for the comic strip name to be taken off it because he didn't want it to be too closely associated. He didn't want it to be too associate closely associated with the group, but he did end up being in a load of them. And um, he, I think, by series three, I think he's kind of considered part of the troupe because, especially when he started writing the show as well. Um, absolutely fabulous. Went into national as well yes i um there's actually a good video about the us remake that i saw recently i haven't seen absolutely fabulous itself yet but um but yes jennifer saunders you if you're familiar with absolutely fabulous that's her show uh she plays eddie monsoon in that um which is a name of a character that uh her husband adrian created because yeah um adrian edmondson and jennifer saunders ended up getting married and they've been married for over 30 years, nearly 40 now. And um, uh, she 
actually, um, Jennifer Saunders was at the event and she said something on the lines of, oh yeah, Aid, Aid and I weren't together until Supergrass. And I'm like, wait, so you weren't together from the beginning? Because um, they play a couple in a series one episode and they're so cute in that. <laughs> so it really shocks me that they weren't a couple earlier than that. Um... Uh, and Dawn and Lenny, though divorced now, so much love amongst that group. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Lenny Henry only appears in series four, I think. Of course, he was in Oxford, which I saw. This I saw the day I went. Actually, um, such a brilliant episode. They'd gone from it's in series four, series three, and series four. They'd they were more story focused by then, and. Um, uh, the early ones that it's just more of like an ensemble of comedy characters and it's there's not much focus on plot which i do like i think it whilst i do l love to see how they when they went into you know the story aspect of it that they did ended up like developing that really well but um um uh, but it's still the early episodes are fun because there's this like, nice little ensemble um actually there's a um a video you must watch it they did it on the set of supergrass it was for one of those you know films coming out this year programs um and um they're just like being really silly and uh, peter richardson's going up to ruby coltrane and saying don't say that tell them the plot of the film he's like no i'm not so the film right it's about um uh this uh this newspaper owner and he dies he says rosebud and then it's the story of his life but he's just he just tells them the plot of citizen kane and um yeah i, I uh but yeah there's um a bit where nigel plane uh not like um it's nigel planer and keith allen are being interviewed together and keith allen says um yeah the comic strip episodes don't have very good plots i mean, I mean like like they do but this is this is more more have some more of a plot. And um they do I don't know Nigel Planer says that the, the plots of these uh, are rubbish. And I, th I think they, they talk down about their work too much in this show. That I think it's a really, really brilliant show. Um I think it has varies in quality more than other shows, obviously more than inside number nine. Um but you know, obviously there's more people writing and it's more it's exciting because you're seeing these writers, these people come into their own because it's their first time writing for television, and they've got this this opportunity. They've got this free reign. They had a lot of um, there's far less studio control. They were saying um, someone stood up and asked a question, saying, um, "Oh, why do you think you know comedy is so tame now?" And Jennifer Saunders went, "No, no, no. It's it's." It's the studios that are the problem. If studios require so much notes, there's so much feedback. It's not the comedians themselves, which I absolutely agree with. Um, you know, it's you know, it's, it's it's other interference. It's it's people. People don't get the same control that they used to. It used to be. I mean, you know, there's more at stake now because television is, you know on the edge people are saying you know the bbc is deteriorating the government are talking about withdrawing um government funding from channel four which is what uh the show originally aired on so so yeah there's there's more pressure so they're trying so they're trying to play it safer so um it's not like they did then where they was just like yeah you're good comedians you probably know what you're doing here's a bunch of money come back with some films please um uh hello dcs media um sadly you've missed us talking about inside number nine but um hopefully you'll uh stay to us talk about comic strip presents it's like i said it's a brilliant show if you guys haven't seen it i do recommend checking it out i'm thinking of doing a video on you know where to start like what episodes i recommend that people start on um like if they like certain things um because a lot of the earlier episodes are parodies um to a certain extent um so yeah um but anyway they really do themselves down too much yeah yeah it just it broke my heart when peter richard was saying oh it's just um because they, they show a best the people i should say from the start of the three it was hosted by richard herring 
And the three guests they had were Peter Richardson, who is attending all future Comic Strip Presents events. He's go- doing the whole tour. Um, the tour is just in the... Uh, it's across the south of England, basically. So I don't think they go any further north than, like, Oxford. But don't quote me on that. Do check Picture House Cinemas yourself selves and the website is kind of a mess so you need to look at the best of listings to work out where they're all going to be and oh I'll, I'll i'll get into that in a minute so the three guests they had were peter richardson um who like i said produced and acted to in some capacity in all of them some of them it's just a cameo and um then jennifer saunders these this is the only one that sh- she's going to do uh, and stephen mangan who um who and if you know his name you know he's a much younger actor um because he um he was in the last two um comic strip films or was it because i'm not sure when um when the five go to rehab was i don't know if that was before tony blair after tony blair i think it might have been after but anyway he he's he's been the he was the lead in one of them that they showed that night and he was um Yeah, Commissioner Bastards. Glad you got a, a dig in about them. Yeah, absolutely. Mangan did three of them. Two as Tony Blair. Yeah, I know he, he did um, a cameo as um, or a short, a small role in uh, Red Top as Tony Blair because uh, not only because they mentioned it, but I remember seeing the trailer for Red Top when it came out uh, about eight years ago, wasn't it? Car- Carrot Top or Red Top? That was what it's called, wasn't it? Red Top. Um. But um, but yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, so yeah, it's it those three, and Peter Richardson. So what they're doing with all of them is they're showing a best of compilation first. Um, if you've seen the, oh, it's on. Um, I don't know if it's on Channel Four, but it'll be on. It's on BritBox. They've got a best of thing there. I think it's mostly that, and so it's like interviews and clips of the show, and then more interviews and more clips of the show. And he was saying, oh, it's, it's showing a bit in little clips, so which I think is, is, it works best as little clips. I'm like, no, these are brilliant shows. <laughs> these are really, really brilliant. Um, Richard Herring was doing a good job of uh, picking up the show, talking about how it was the first comedy show ever to air on Channel 4, so everyone would have seen it and how revolutionary it was to the people who saw it. And they had a few interviews of um you know celebrities talking about um it like simon Pegg in the in the best of bit was talking about it and the best of was done quite a while ago i think i think it was done for the sorry i became unplugged then did it for the 30th anniversary um he didn't edit the clips well. Didn't fix the screen ratio. I didn't notice the uh, issue with the uh, the screen ratio, but um, it was very clearly the thing, like a an established documentary that was like edited and fiddled around with. Because of course they included clips of the ones that were going to be shown later that night. Um, but yeah, um, it did seem a bit all over the place but yeah it was really really lovely it is my um it is such a brilliant show um so uh, so yeah like i said it started off with a best of compilation and that was that was really um it, it was good to uh, most of them i had seen because they showed a lot of early ones um and you know i i love them all um to a certain extent even my least favorite has a lot of charm to it my least favorite is war um which is the second episode of series one um but it's 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 i just i i get a lot of fun out of watching it um even though i think it is the weakest of what i've seen i i i get a lot of fun out of watching it um but um Anyway, so start off with the best of compilation. This is Five Go Mad in Dorset. This is a. Um, <laughs> I love how it started with some snogging clips. Yes, I mean, it, the whole compilation felt a little bit like it started out of nowhere, but <laughs> yeah, it was great. Um, it was just French and Saunders saying, Oh, the best part about it is we've, we've kissed everyone in the cast. <laughs> and then it showed the compilation. 
lovely. Um, but uh, but yes, as you, as you can see, this is Five Go Mad and Dorset. Um, Famous Five were uh, a massive series of kids books. They were I read them as a kid, um, but they were inescapable at the time in which they were growing up. And there was a TV adaptation a few years earlier. So obviously it would have still very much been in, in like the public memory, the famous five. Uh, and it is, it is so well known today. Uh, <laughs> yes, they didn't include Peter and Keith kissing. <laughs> I do love, I've, I've seen the bullshitters. I haven't seen Detectives on the Air and the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown, but I have seen the bullshitters and I do love that. Because I I grew up on Starsky and Hutch, and I know it's a it's most closely a uh, a parody of The Professionals, which is a show I haven't seen. But um, Starsky and Hutch uh, was a, a buddy cop show that was famous for having um, people joked about it them having quite a homoerotic relationship because they weren't afraid to like hug each other in serious situations and that kind of thing. So um, so yeah, it did. <laughs> So yeah, it did feel a bit like a parody of that, and yeah, it's a parody of you know, tough guy cop shows in general um, that were uh, around a lot in the seventies and eighties. Um, yeah, too self indulgent, I guess. <laughs> yeah, um, but uh, yeah, uh, but yeah, um, but did did it show them running around in the in the leather jackets and the little pants? Which in the bullshit has got uh, when I first saw that for the first time, got such a big laugh out of me. <laughs> Um, but yeah, anyway, Famous Five is is such a good parody of uh, uh Five Go Mad and Dorset. It's such a good parody of the Famous Five. Uh, fun fact: it's actually filmed in Devon, not in Dorset. Um, so that's probably the most famous thing that they did, apart from Bad News. They did show a lot of clips of Bad News. I don't think I can't remember if they even showed any clips of Bad News. Can you remember, Laura? But they did play the Bad News tracks from the bad news album um they, they pretty much stuck it to just the, the tracks where they were singing really um either the proper songs or ones that they're messing about with songs like when they're trying to play pretty woman um but yeah so if you've seen spinal tap it's like that um uh, someone did ask oh, what do you think of spinal tap you know them coming out after you and peter richardson went, no, no no they they were filmed around the same time because uh, of course spinal tap um was a feature film uh and um the original bad news is only half an hour um ah uh, yes i did show them coming on stage at castle donnington um actually my dad was actually there he was at monsters of rock that year and he saw them at reading so um yeah um i i am thinking of going to another one of these and if i do i'll probably try and go to one of the bad news ones because I mean, even though it's an episode I've seen before, the two episodes I saw the other night I hadn't seen before, but I love bad news so much. <laughs> it is so brilliant. Um so yeah. If you if you've seen Spinal Tap, it is similar. I don't think there's any evidence to show that e either of them would have um seen each other. So there's I don't think there's a possibility that either stole from the other. Um I actually got um uh, I made a post about uh, bad news on the Spinal Tap subreddit, and it got deleted. I mean, I, I wasn't saying that, that they'd stolen the idea from them, because I, I don't think that at all. And someone had said, oh, they'd um, the, the Spinal Tap short film would ca come out beforehand, but there's, I don't think there's any chance that it would have been shown over here. I might be wrong, but I think that it, it, it was just, a, I know pe people say parallel thinking is a excuse certain comedians use for um copying other people's material but I, I genuinely think it is um yeah yeah i'm just, just there trying to share the love of something that i think will appeal to fans of spinal tap because i think if you like spinal tap you will probably like bad news you might not think it's as good you might think it's it's better but you might not think it's as good but yeah you know, i think you'll still enjoy it if you're a fan of spinal tap i think um Spinal Tap are probably catchier, um, but there's, there's really, I mean, in terms of like the material they use, like I, there's there's not no comparisons in like the actual material, you know, like it's it's just they're just parodying the same thing. They're parodying rockumentaries and they're parodying bands. Um, there's not the only, the closest thing in terms of like actual scenes they have in common is in 
uh, in Spinal Tap and in More Bad News, there's a female character who calls out the misogyny of their work. That's like the closest I can get. That's not even... It's like not even close, man. Um, uh, so yeah, my says yeah i went to this with my dad as well and uh <laughs> we were like chatting beforehand whilst listening to this and then in between singing along to warriors of genghis khan which is one of my uh which is I, i've just that clip of them doing the music video for warriors of genghis khan for more bad news i've seen so many times um so yeah the ruttles come before both of them them and all yeah they do um i think um and then again, you know, Eric Idol says that he was the, the did the first mockumentary. There are mockumentaries that predate that. Um, a lot of what we see in the Ruttles it, are like the core aspects of mockumentaries because I think the ones, there are very few that predate it, but they're mostly sort of satirical, uh, like dark satire rather than parody and the sort of the stuff that we see in that. But, um, but yeah, I definitely say that... Um, Bad News and Spinal Tap are far more similar because they're parodying the same type of documentary, like a one that follows the band rather than like a retrospective, which is what the Ruttles is parodying. Uh, and that, and of course, they're both more sort of down to earth and relatable and, you know, inspired by uh, real people. And, you know, both uh, both have had, uh, had musicians say that they're like massively relatable. Um, but um, you know, Spinal Tap is a band on their way down, and um, Bad News is a band on their way up that are so shit they'll never get up there. <laughs> but um, but yeah, uh, really brilliant. Um, Bad News, and they were produced by Brian May. Their uh, their musical efforts. Um, they butcher Bohemian Rhapsody, and it is my. I've, I think I've listened to it more times than the real thing now. <laughs> I certainly can't remember the last time I've heard the real thing. But, um... No, 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 no. Absolutely not! <laughs> um, yeah, I, I absolutely love that, um... That, that their version of the song because especially because it's not their song. They're free to make it sound as terrible as possible. Um... I just think they're a bit more hesitant to to do with um with the original tracks, you know. Um, uh, Aiden Rick fans may like to know that AIDS made a two hour long bottom documentary for Gold that's on um, uh, Thursday the eighteenth of April at nine pm. Yes, I don't have Gold. I don't know if it'll be on UK TV Play, but I, yeah, I really, really want to watch that. Um, my friend George over at Headphones UK, who um, I did the Psychoville live streams with, and I'm doing a series of Dark Crystal live streams with. He uh, he's a really big fan of the show. He's he's uh, actually the person who got me to start watching Bottom. Really, um, I think I'd seen some comic strip, um, and I'd seen the New Statesman, um, and the New Statesman is is like such a reserved show. It's like the Rick Mail shows because it's not it's not a goofy show and he's playing someone who's um uh who's st still very smug but he's someone with a lot of power and he's quite different from his other roles but he just you know it's a less goofy role but he just he just like squeezes every drop of comedy out of every single scene he's in i i haven't seen anything like it it's, it's fucking phenomenal um but um but yeah hopefully i'll get the chance to, to watch the documentary some way um but i know there's a young ones documentary they made a few years ago for tv that i haven't seen i'd like to see that at some point um but um by the way there's um uh i recommend rick mail scrapbook uh it's a website run by a lady who um is a super fan of rick mail she um was like a teenager at the time the young ones came out and you know went to see a load of his like she went to see the gas episode of bottom live and that kind of thing and she went to see him do stand up a load of times and so she's she shares her collection online she like transcribes 
articles and interviews about them and share and she has um loads of posters and um yeah she uh, also sells if she's got any duplicates of merchandise like vhs tapes or dvds or books she sells them uh on her website and i've just bought the um uh the new statesman book the bastard file um and i also bought um she makes rick mail badges um to support the cost of keeping her website ad free i was choosing which ones to get because you know the more you pay the, the more you get um and it i i looked and realized it was rick mail's birthday and i went fuck it i'm getting all of them so i've got all 12 now <laughs> one of them is this, this character here colin grigson but yeah i absolutely love bad news so uh, anyway back to the event um i did some clips um of uh, you know the best of and like i said it was it felt quite messily edited because it was like they got a documentary from 10 years ago and then they'd cut in clips of the things they were showing that night um it's still i, I do recommend go going because um it was very good and um there was a Q and A sort of halfway through the clips, wasn't there? And then a Q and A afterwards, if I remember rightly, Laura. And um, yeah, I uh, I was there with my script book, and the the question I was originally going to ask is: there were five episodes that were made for series one. As many of you will know, with a British show, the custom is six episodes per series. They wrote a six episode, but they were un. The, but Channel 4 refused to let them film it. It's published in the script book, though. My original question was, um, because I knew, I'd read, just read on Wikipedia that the reason why was slander uh, or libel, whichever whichever it would have been, um, in a, presumably from a scene in which, um, the only scene in which real celebrities are named, I think, Um Alan Pillay, who now goes by Lana Pillay, there um, she's a trans um, entertainer. Um, it comes on as uh, themselves, who uh, most of their roles in comic strip they are playing themselves and they are credited as themselves. And um, like they ask them about all the gay gossip, and they list a load of celebrities who are not openly gay, um, and obviously some who who are now revealed to be gay, you know, like Elton John. Um, and I think people were still being sued for accusing people, celebrities of being homosexual in the 80s. So um, so I was, I was going to bring up, like, why was it, uh, were they allowed to publish it? Or did they have to cut stuff out of the published version? But um, I ended up asking a slightly different question about the same episode. I held up the book, which was good because then I managed to get seen. And um, I was so nervous. It's, you know that scene in Bottom where, where Richie's... Um, making the dating video and he, he he goes hello i can't i can't see any of you but i'm sure you've all got smashing blouses on that's what i sounded like <laughs> trying to ask them um yeah i've tried to be remember the order of the q and a's as well bit odd but i didn't mind it yeah yeah i didn't mind the you know it, it didn't it didn't feel like we were losing time or anything it was it was all really good but yeah um but yeah they were smiling at me and i was just like oh they're all smiling at me <laughs> oh <laughs> you sounded really normal oh thank you <laughs> i oh, oh i was i was i felt so nervous and i felt like i'm rambling and i was just like that I'm talking to them and they know I exist in a way that felt quite different from seeing um, Rishi Smith and Steve Pemberton at the BFI because I was, you know, interacting with them. So I was, I was, I was so nervous. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, so I was like, so I, you know, instead of just one or two of you writing the script, which is most of the time it's two of them writing the script um or one of them writing the script but most of the time it's 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 two members of the cast who have written a script uh, as, and um in that one all of the main cast apart from rick mail had written the script um with the addition of 
um, Peter Richardson's writing partner, Peter Richards, uh, or Pete Richards, which um, is it, what are the chances that the, his writing partner would have an almost identical name? I mean, was he just like putting a pair of glasses on like Clark Kent and saying, oh no, that that line, that that's your part got cut. It wasn't my decision. It was the decision of my writing partner. <laughs> but um, but anyway, so yeah, what, yeah, I was asking why was it like a bunch of you writing it and uh, instead of just one or two of you and uh, they're like, well, I don't know. It was 40 years ago. <laughs> But and Jennifer was like, "Oh, I think it was we all we had different characters and in, in that." And I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, I think I think I think that was it. Um, it's really good." Um, and they're like, "Oh, thanks," because <laughs> I think a lot of people assume because the title character got used in another episode, Eddie Monsoon. Uh, not Eddie Monsoon that appears in Absolutely Fabulous, but uh, a character Adrian Edmondson plays called Eddie Monsoon. I think because of that, people then assume that most of that material got used in um in that series two episode i don't think any of it got used at all um the one they ended up doing was a like a mockumentary um about this celebrity in rehab um whilst the um the other one was um like a fake chat show um and um French and Saunders and Richardson and Plano, they were playing, you know, the different characters in the show. And like I said, um, Alana Play was there as uh, as themselves. And um, yeah, it was a. It, I don't think any material has been used at all. Um, by the way, Laura, have you read the script? I definitely think they should, if they because they're doing something for charity i think i'd love to see them do a charity reading of that because you know all the cast is is still alive because rick mail wasn't in it so all of the cast uh who wrote it and who it was written for are still alive so how oh, you haven't it, it, it is brilliant i'll um uh the book is available on world of books second hand um or at least i think it still is i'd Hope I didn't snag the last copy, but uh, World of Books or Wob as it's now called, is really good for cheap secondhand books. Um, I've been getting a lot of uh, comedy books from there recently. Um, so, uh, League of Gentlemen script book, League of Gentlemen local book, the Mighty Boosh book, the Young Ones book. I nearly got the Bastard file from there, but I decided to get it from. Um, uh, well, first of all, I ordered it from. Um, uh, well, the books, but they said it was damaged, so they couldn't send it. So I ended up getting it from Rick Mail scrapbook instead. And um, anyway, um, so uh, you can tell how much I'm in, I enjoyed the, the times I spent at all of these things because I've I've been talking so much. Usually, if I'm on a, one of these things by my own, doing anything unscripted, I'm so awkward. And and I'm I'm less like that now. It's it's, it's brilliant because I'm I just had such a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful time. Um, Anyway, so um, so yeah, I'm trying to think of any other interesting revelations, like the fact that um, oh, there's a brilliant story about Robbie Coltrane. Um, Jennifer Saunders said the first time we met Robbie was on the set of Five Go Mad in Dorset, and he turned up in his cab two hours late and asleep, and it was it was really difficult to wake him up, but <laughs> but once he was awake, he was brilliant, and I don't know what the gap was between. Five Go Mad and Dorset and those are and the later ones in that series, um, but he is in nearly every episode of series one, and he's in. Like I said, I, I consider Rick Mail to be part of like the core cast in inverted commas, but um, he ends up being in the same amount of episodes as Robbie Coltrane. And um, but yeah, Rob. Um, but yeah, I, I think. I wouldn't be surprised if it was just Robbie Coltrane making a really good impression in Five Go Mad and Dorset, which is why they kept casting him, because he is ab absolutely wonderful. Though he did work with Rick Mail and Adrian Edmondson and Kevin Turvey behind the green door, um, which I will be reviewing soon. I'm planning on doing... I, I feel hesitant announcing things because I've been so inconsistent with my posting. Uh, I've been really struggling with um, consistent posting because of um, 
yeah, this is just mainly it's not really stuff going on in my life that's been in the way. It's um it, it's mainly just me not being in the right headspace for it. Um I mean I interviewed the guy who did the Psychoville websites, the former head of digital comedy at the BBC in November. I still haven't finished editing the video just because I'm never in the right headspace for it. Um, because I'm so awkward. <laughs> but yeah, I am planning on talking about comic strip and Rick Mayle uh and his work quite soon. Um, after a big Beatles thing. That'll be my next big project. Um, sort of multi video thing, not sure how many videos. And then I'll do a multi video thing on Rick Mail. Um but yeah, definitely, you know. Yeah, subscribe and hit the bell icon. You know, you've, you've heard that all before. Um, if you want to see that, oh, was he briefly in the young ones as a bouncer? Yes, and he was also in two episodes of series two. Actually, he that was series one where he was a bouncer. In series two, he's a captain of a pirate radio station. Who's also a cyclops, and he's also a scientist. Where Tony Robinson comes in and says, "Please," it was like a Victorian uh, doctor and. Uh, uh, Tony Robinson comes in and is like, please, sir, I, I beg you to see this patient. Remember, he is a man. And just, a, a fucking elephant walks in. <laughs> I love that bit. Um... um... Ah, oh, of course, Robbie's cake brained Nigel. Um oh do you mean in the um in Bambi when the when the Eclair falls on them? Is that what you mean? But um of course Bambi is probably it's probably people's it's I think it's probably like generally people's favourite episode. It's probably the most famous one, they're like, oh, the university challenge one. Um Yeah, yeah, Bambi. But um Anyway, see, so yeah, I'm trying to think of any other stories because there were so many lovely stories. I'd love to share them on here. Um, um, and Jennifer Saunders was talking about like how she and Dawn are finding their footing and they ended up writing for it as well. And it was their first time doing anything that's how they learned how it worked. And Peter Richardson, uh, I knew this about Five Go Mad and Dorset. I didn't realise this happened with other ones. But most of the crew is like Peter Richardson's family, which I think is so sweet. I mean, I knew in Five Go Mad in Dorset, it was he's either from Devon or his family is from Devon. So that's why. And they were like staying at his mum's house or something in bunk beds. <laughs> um and then they'd they'd get a little bit of money from uh, from the budget to spend in the pub. They get like ten pounds that they'd spend in the pub. It's really lovely. Um, I can't think of any other sources off my head. Um, Laura, do you remember if Jennifer Saunders was was billed as being there for the second half with uh, Hunt for Tony Blair and the GLC? Because I seem to remember they were. Oh, they stayed in a hospital type place on Hope Cove. Yeah, that was it. I think they they, they saw his mum at some point. Like she was probably doing the catering or something like that. <laughs> But yeah, it was like his whole family were working on there. And it said that it just kind of felt like a family. Um, and he's like, yeah, we didn't get a trailer or anything. No, I don't think she was billed for that. Yeah, yeah, I, I wasn't sure if she was or not. But she wasn't there for the second half. Um, so yeah, I, it was a shame I didn't manage to get an autograph from her, which I really would have loved. Um but, you know, hey-ho. Um, I did see her before the show. I saw her in the foyer. There was a, uh, a curtained-off bit in the corner of the bar upstairs um, for the, you know, the celebrity guests. But um, um, but I, I saw her in the foyer. Um, I think she'd just arrived or her friend had just arrived, so she was talking to her friends. And um, But, like, I didn't want to bother her. That's the thing. I'm very, very much aware of the fact that I am bothering people. So, um, so yeah, I didn't go up to her then. Um, but I don't regret not doing that um, when I had the opportunity because I didn't want to bother her. Um, but I did manage to get, uh, after the first half, I did manage to get 
uh, a photo with Peter Richardson and his autograph. And I just went, I, he was talking about stuff not aging well. And um, the thing is, is that they were very politically aware. Um, so their stuff for the time is very left wing. And because of that, their stuff has aged very well because because of that's what their intentions were when they were talking about racism they were satirizing racism apparently at the time um Peter richardson said his um town in devon refused to show the episode because it was um because like oh, it's, it's racist and sexist like no it's, it's very clearly parodying those things um but it is shocking it is more shocking now because you know, the racism they were satirizing, you know, obviously they were satirizing 1950s racism and classism and sexism and xenophobia in Five Go Mad and Dorset. But with, um, uh, but, you know, racism in the 80s, you know, I, I mean, it's, racism is so le far much, it's less accepted now. You know, if you watch an episode like The Yob, um, and I, I think it's very clear who, the comedy is aimed at but you know i think i think media illiteracy is not a, a media illiteracy is not a new concept uh <laughs> but i think you know i think it's but i mean you know i i can understand if it's still less palatable for people now because it is more shocking because you know people don't go to fancy dress parties dressed as nazis anymore um um racism still exists but it's not as open or accepted and the vocabulary has um has certainly changed so um so yeah um uh, he's yeah so he was talking about it stuff like, like aging well and i i, I when i saw when i went up to him i think i said I, I think the stuff's aged really well i watch it all the time i think the full episodes are, are, are really good because yeah I, I, it's, it's, oh, I just felt slightly heartbroken for him that he wasn't he didn't think his stuff was that good um, Herring did a decent job was less in awe of Peter than in the um, uh, recent Richard Herring's Letter Square Theatre podcast um, I haven't seen that but um, but yeah I, he did mention that he'd, he'd done the podcast with him I, yeah, I mean if it was the first time he'd met him I, managed, I imagine he would have been rather starstruck but I mean I, I felt starstruck by Peter Richardson which it sounds weird because obviously he's, he is the least famous member of the cast because um they the others kind of went off and did their own things whereas he kind of stuck with comic strip presents he did do things afterwards but he he did kind of stick with comic strip presents and it's still what he's best known for so he is the the smallest name out of all of them and he, the least recognizable face and he looks very different now as an old man than the way he did when he was younger you wouldn't you wouldn't recognize him he is a, a few years older than some of the others but you definitely wouldn't recognize him unless you'd seen a recent picture of him um uh i got peter and nigel's autographs at last year's slapstick festival and it was pretty starstruck yeah yeah <laughs> um so yeah I bought, I bought my script book and he signed that and he uh, on the first page, there's a picture of uh, all of them apart from Rick. So he just drew a line to himself. It's a picture of him as Spider in uh, Bad News Tour. And he wrote his name. And uh, yeah, I just said, I just think you're wonderful. And um, uh, yeah, I was, I was just so happy. Um, um, Herring mentioned on his podcast that Peter was very good looking in the 80s, which is so true. My God. Yeah, he wasn't bad looking, was he? Um, but um, yeah, anyway. Uh, yeah, I was. Yeah, it was, it was really nice. I, I couldn't believe it. You know, I went and um, uh, I rang up my brother afterwards. <laughs> you know during the interview interval because um, he's the one who got me watching comic strip in the first place um he's not as big a fan of it as me but i'm um like i said i'm i'm, I'm i am seriously considering going to another one and i think i might take him along to that um but um 
don't think there's more to talk about here. Uh, so we're going to the second half. Yeah, we're still on the first half. I think I've spent, I've been up live for an hour and 45 minutes. And I think I've spent about a, an hour of that just talking about the comic strip. Um, not that I love it more than Inside Number Nine. I think it's just, obviously, there's a lot more than I, I can talk about. Um, you know, most of Q was further, was, you know, for, uh, farther back and I can't tell you what I saw at the BFI um, and yes yeah, so this is only a few days ago so of course I can remember it so much better um, but anyway so Hunt for Tony Blair this came out in 2011 uh, the Hunt for Tony Blair looked fantastic on the big screen yes um, the um, the original comic strip episodes I doubt that the original comic strip episodes have been restored in any way because they, they, they. I mean, they certainly don't look restored whenever I watch them, and I've, I've been watching them all on BritBox. Um, they didn't look in great co comedy on them. They were shot on film rather than television. They were on sh all shot on film, but they hadn't, didn't look as if they'd been cleaned up in any way, which, I'm not, isn't necessarily a bad thing, really. You know, it's why well, see it in better quality than they would have seen it at the time. You know, but um, and of course, a lot of them were film parodies, so it makes sense. But um, anyway, so Hunt for Tony Blair. It's um, Tony Blair has been accused of mass murder <laughs> for declaring war in Iraq, and um, so uh, he goes on the run, and it's. It's done in the style of a 1950s sort of fugitive political thriller. And um, it's just wonderful. Um, as usual, I do I do feel like, oh, I, I, I think I would appreciate this a bit more if I was more familiar with the kind of film they're parodying. I felt that with the, the Beat Generation episode from series one, um, where they all play um, uh, beat poets in the 1960s. But uh, I didn't... But, like this i enjoyed it regardless um when the whole the news they were parodying was news i was a child i was a young child i was um um i'm 26 now so this would have been so this this episode came out when i was 13 um uh, i think i think it was 2011 uh 39 steps yes i know i know of the 39 steps i know it's one of the things it parodies and um uh, that famous film about the actress uh, Sunset Boulevard, is it? That's um. Well, uh, I know that's supposed to be what um Jennifer Saunders' version of Margaret Thatcher is. So um. So yeah, it's it's stocked with comedy gold. I it uh Stephen Mangan was asked, you know, what was it like coming into this um this environment, and it said he said it was really really welcoming. You know, you were aware that. It's these people who all know each other for you've known each other for decades and um and they're this sort of family but they welcome you in and it, oh it was just so lovely um and um so yeah marvelous and uh yeah in case you're wondering how accurate it is i don't think tony blair actually slept with margaret thatcher it is a very <laughs> It is a very silly parody, and Tony Blair just sort of accidentally kills people and uh, ends up, or, or sometimes purposely killing people and justifying it. And um, it's it's from what from what I know about Tony Blair, which isn't that much, it's a very good satire of his character. There are moments when they just read parts of his autobiography and say, "That's actually part of my autobiography, page sixty one," <laughs> and. Um, so yeah, I think it's absolutely brilliant. They did do uh, this and um, the most recent one, Carrot Top, not Carrot Top, Red Top from 2016, um, which is about the phone hacking scandal. They're both in, you know, quite sort of topical political things. But I just want to be safe for people who aren't familiar with the show. The not not that many episodes are as topical as those ones. Um, I mean, series one, the most topical is war. I mean, which is like sort of Monty Python meets Red Dawn, uh, <laughs> just because it, it's a, about just the Cold War threat in general. Um, and um, anyway, 
Um, so, um, so yeah, I thought it was a, it was good. It's a, it's an hour long, I think. Uh, it's one of the longer ones. Um, and yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed it. I was, despite not being that familiar with the stuff that they're satirizing, either in terms of film genre or the the real people. Um, I still found it really funny and really engaging. And as you can see um, in that cast picture there, it's a combination of um, the core cast and your faces. And um, it's, it's just so lovely. Um, it, it, it feels like um, there's something quite welcoming that, that, that feel that you got from the fact that they, they were bringing, you know, new younger talent in. Um Anyway, I, I love I loved Jennifer Saunders' part here as uh, <laughs> Margaret Thatcher's a aging film star, and um, they did talk a little bit afterwards about um, about uh, Rick Mayall and Robbie Coltrane and John Sessions, who had a small role as um, uh, Thatcher's butler, um, who is a far less famous face. Uh, he was. Um, if you're familiar with whose line is it anyway, in uh, the original British version, he was in every episode of series one and they ended up being in quite a few episodes after that. So um, he was in an episode of Sherlock as well, uh, for those of you who remember Sherlock, um, episode three of series one, I believe. And um, um, it's mentioned, you know, he sort of died during the pandemic and not a lot of people noticed, which is quite sad. Um, I noticed because I'd... I'd um, uh, I was obsessed with um, Whose Lines Anyway, um, my brother and I, when we were, I think when he was about 10 and I was about 13, we watched that all the time on, because um, they uh, uploaded them all onto um, whatever the Channel 4 streaming service is called now. I can never remember what the name is because they've changed it so many times. But um, and Stephen Mangan talked about working with Rick Mail and he doesn't have a big part in it rick mail but he um he'd worked with him before in watership down which was before mail's accident which was um for those of you who don't know rick mail had a catastrophic uh quad bike accident where he nearly died and um he um was never quite the same afterwards um from the sounds of it and um anyway so next um, is was the GLC. Um, I'd read about it because I knew it was a sp spiritual sequel to The Strike, which is one of my favourite episodes of Comic Strip. Um, the Strike is an interesting episode. It's a show within a show, um, or a, a film within a film, really. Um, it's about... Um, if you've ever seen the show episodes, actually, it's like that. Um, there's another show I was thinking of comparing it to, but you know, it's a show about someone who'd written this script this very personal script and then the hollywood machine pulls it apart and tries to make it more relatable or tropic thunder it made me think of tropic thunder as well uh to a certain extent it's how the hollywood machine changes things until it's um it saps the originality out of it until it's this sort of um uh husk of its former self but um uh so it's um it was a, a a a political event the um the miners strike that's been uh written by Alexis character who was a former miner um and they um uh and it ends up getting ruined and they cast al pacino was um the head of the miners union and it becomes this sort of oscar bait action film um series 3 was uh, one hour episodes, series four, they went back to half hour episodes. So it makes sense that they did, they didn't do the, the, I mean, there is a little bit at the beginning where they show footage of the premiere of it being a film within a film. Um, but not as much. It's literally, you see them interviewing the cast. It's, um, so they're, they're all playing celebrities, playing real people. And th with this one, it's a different political scandal, the GLC, which I know even less about. Um, it was the uh, the Labour government had won an election in, um, in the London Council, something like that. 
and um so uh uh dawn french you can see that the hair there she's playing Cher, <laughs> playing a real person um who's a single mother with three kids who also have massive wigs <laughs> and sparkly dresses on um you see Peter Richardson there. He's playing Lee Van Cleef. Um, they, uh, I know he's a big fan of westerns because he's um, he's parodied them multiple times. He parodied, them for, I mean, for the stuff I've seen so far. He's done. Uh, he played a sort of Mexican bandit character in War, and then he uh, for a sh short bit, and then A Fistful of Travelers Checks is primarily a, a western parody, and they actually went to Spain to, where um the Sergio Leone westerns were filmed um which um for a few dollars more I haven't seen the good about the ugly but for a few dollars more is one of my favorite films of all time so um uh so yeah I am familiar with Lee Van Cleef um so he did a very good <laughs> parody it's, it's just it, it, they, they do it as like it's just like from what I can tell it was just like the a labor council got a elected and then Thatcher tried to shut it down and they turn it into like a shootout and um I can't remember who Adrian Edmondson's supposed to play what actor he's supposed to play playing the role of um Prince Charles but <laughs> he, he was very funny um he played a few roles actually I think he's the only one to multi-role Adrian Edmondson he's in he's in he and Jennifer Saunders are in the second most amount of episodes uh because I looked this up on um IMDb the other day. They're both in 30 episodes each. Uh, Robbie Coltrane and Rick Mail are in 90 episodes each. And Peter Richardson's in all 42. Um, I don't know why I remember all this. <laughs> I, can't remember, I can't believe so many of you guys are, uh, are here. Thank you so much. Um, anyway. So yeah, I... Um, Oh, Kevin Allen played four characters. Ah, oh, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, Keith, Keith Allen's brother, uh, Kevin. Uh, he's he's in quite a lot of them. He's probably most. He's he's he's. Um, I don't know if he's better known as a director because he's. I know he's a director as well. But I think people a role where people are more likely to recognise him is. Um, I think it was Adrian Edmondson who played three, but. I mean, um, there could have been someone else, though, actually. Um, uh, but, yeah, Ke um, Kevin Allen, I think people are more likely, the thing he, people are more likely to recognise him from because it was a series, was The Thin Blue Line. He's only in series one. His character gets replaced um, by a, another character um, uh, who serves quite a different role, Um but is but in, it's the sort of same position in the force. Um, I do recommend Thin Blue Line, by the way. It's Ben Elsa's sitcom. Um, kind of ironic considering in the how much um, a cab messaging there is in <laughs> uh, both the young ones and um, Filthy Rich and Cat Flap. But um, I don't know if that was mainly Rick Mail's influence or um, or oh, it was, it's kind of like Dad's Army actually. Thin Blue Line. I do recommend Thin Blue Line. Um, but um, anyway, so actually, I do really like this scene. And this scene, every time they cut to leave to the um, uh, Peter Richardson playing Lee Van Cleef, he's lighting a match, uh, and he's lighting his pipe, and it's it's such a silly thing, but it did really make me laugh. Um, so yeah, here's uh, Robbie Coltrane. <laughs> There's a great big shootout, and there's this great bit where um, you know the different characters, where people are running off and leaving before the siege takes place. He's like, you know, is there anyone who wants to leave? And he then turns and says, "What about you, alternative comedians?" And it's just French and Saunders and Adrian Edmondson and um, Peter Richardson playing themselves, and they've got they're like, um, actually, I've got a voiceover at four, <laughs> and run off. Um, so yeah I did like that bit and um, so yeah I, I hadn't seen it before I um, um, I wasn't certain about it going in because like I said it didn't have the film within a film thing but I don't see how they could have done that twice 
um without it, them just repeating the same thing in of the the writer having their script destroyed um actually that episode the, the episode the strike ends with them uh the producer going up to Alexis sales character he's like you should write about the glc and he goes yeah and charles bronson should play ken livingston is it the guy who plays i can't remember but yeah <laughs> Yeah, that alternative comedians bit was amazing. Yeah, <laughs> I do love that bit. A nice little fourth wall break. Um. So, uh, so anyway, um. So yeah, I can't think of if there are any other interesting anecdotes after that. Oh, although actually, there was no Q and A after that. Um, it was the end. I. Uh, thought I missed on getting a picture with Stephen Mangan at the end. But I um uh but again I didn't want to take up much of his time but I did manage to um see him uh just as everyone was leaving so um uh but he was on his own he wasn't having like a queue of people coming up to him so I just ran up to him and said Mr Mangan can I have a picture with you please and he went, yeah sure so I had a selfie with him I just went I'm a really big fan and I just sort of gave him a awkward pass in the arm and ran off um <laughs> because i am a really big fan of his i've seen episodes i've seen green wing um i'm certain i've seen him in other things but those are obviously the first two that spring to mind because i think those are the two most popular things he's done where he's been the lead in this in the shows um but yeah i can't but yeah um i i, I could have had the opportunity to to say something else but i don't know if the words would have come out <laughs> i honestly don't mangan was great green ring is one of my top five favorite sitcoms yeah it is it is a really good show um i do love the fact that it's so so weird but at the same time you really get drawn into like you know the love triangle stuff it just like sucks you in and oh i remember watching it with my mum. um and I was in my late teens and just, yeah, just being so engaged by it. Um, um, so, yeah, this is, is a brilliant show. Um, oh, yes, I did talk about the writing process with Green Ring, didn't they? I didn't know that about the writing process and Green Ring. Fascinating. Yeah, I knew it was obviously the writers of um, uh, oh, Smack the Pony. It was the writers of Smack the Pony, which I knew um but yeah i didn't know that there's like any sort of cast input and that kind of thing which uh there's he was saying something along the lines of um there'd be like a week for writing and the writers would go off and write and then the, they'd like collaborate with the cast members after that or something and then they'd film the show um i mean i wonder if that was just that was partially because of the they were filming in a real hospital which is why the show ended up being cancelled after two series um, the one flaw of Green Wing is the the fact that it sets up a whole series worth of plot threads, and then is forced to um, tie them all up in a, a th ninety minute episode. I think it is, um, which is quite bittersweet. But um, but yeah, still great show. But um, but yeah, it 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 does, doesn't surprise me that it's a show with cast input. You got that feeling of the cast knowing each other well and knowing them their material well and i don't know I'm, I'm probably sounding like an idiot but um but yeah yeah green ring is a fantastic show so um uh yeah i was, I was you know, really happy that i i got to meet him and get a picture with him and um so now i'm going to show you guys where to get tickets because the layout of the website is confusing um every time i've shown friends how to uh, where to get tickets i've had to then explain to them how to look at it properly which is annoying so i'll just show you guys that now um every time i'm on this i forget how to share my screen
here we are. This is the Picture House website, the Comic Strip Presents page. So these are the different things. They're in cinemas across the country. Um, there's, they're all double bills they're showing. So the first half of all of them, from the looks of it, is the best of. Um, obviously, it'll probably be a different edit every time you, you go because it'll be a, of different stuff. And then after that, after the interval, there's a double bill of two episodes. Um, so obviously they all, you can see they vary in length quite a bit. Um, you can see there's some two one-hour episodes shown back to back. Um, that one's a one-hour episode and a half-hour episode. Um, uh, that's a one-hour episode and a film, a feature film. Um so yeah, they all vary in uh, in length quite a bit, and they're all at different places around the country, and they're all with different um, guests. So these aren't the only dates. When you click on them, you'll then see more dates. So yeah, then you can see there's two two dates for that one, but it won't have shown up when you when you just look at it on that page there. So it's a bit confusing. So what you need to do. Is go to the best of, and then you'll see all the dates and all the locations. It'll it with a lot of them. It, some of them they say the location. Some of them they say the name of the cinema. In which case you will then have to look it up and find out where that is, um, like the Ritzy, for example. Um, most of the ones on this bit they have listed the cities, but yeah, like I said. It's mostly the south of the UK, so obviously I know that's disappointing for anyone further north, like in the Midlands or Scotland or whatever. Um, but they, they do do relatively far. I think the furthest north is probably Cambridge or Oxford, and the furthest west, I think, is Exeter, I think. Obviously, if you're in Wales, that's not too, not too far from the south of Wales, is it, Exeter? Um... So, yeah, most of them are hosted by Robin Ince, um, who is – he presents Infinite Monkey Cage with um, Brian Cox, which is um, Radio 4, which is what he's best known for. But he's, he's very good. He's a writer and a comedian and um, obsessed with books. Um, and he's, he's, he's really good at interviewing people as well. He was at that book festival I mentioned earlier where I saw Nigel Planer. So, I yeah, I – um i'd i'd put you know i'd um i'd but part of the reason i want to see another one is because i want to see robin host it um anyway so i think nigel planer is the guest for most of them obviously like i said peter richardson's the guest with all of them um but yeah you can see there harry enfield i think that's the only one harry enfield is doing then there's two of the lexi sale Two with Keith Allen. Um, by the way, if the name sounds familiar, you don't know who he is. Um, uh, because I haven't really mentioned this other stuff he's been in. If you remember the Robin Hood series from like 2006 that was on whenever Doctor Who wasn't on, he was the sheriff of Nottingham in that. Uh, and also he's Lily Allen's dad. So that's also where you might have heard of him if you're like my age. Um, anyway, um, so yeah. And then there's a couple of Stephen Mangan and Nigel Planer, um, which I think is the only other ones where there's going to be more than one guest aside from Peter Richardson. So, um, so yeah, I'm definitely I'm not sure which ones I'm going to be going to. I have no idea. Um, I'd be happy. I'd be happy with with any of them really, but um, I definitely want to see another one, and I definitely want to see one hosted by Robin Ince. Um, See if I can get some more signatures. Uh, <laughs> um, I've got the Young Ones book as well. And uh, today I ordered uh, Neil's Book of the Dead, uh, as in Nigel Plain's book as his uh, Young Ones character. Um, ah, it's more comments from Laura. Um, Robin Ince hosted the comic strip events at last year's Slapstick Festival and it was great. 
yeah I'd, I'd love to go to that at some point the slapstick festival i don't know if i'll be able to go this year unfortunately but um but yeah the book festival i went to was one that he was he was i don't know if he's hosting it i don't know how it works um i think he's had some part in in organizing it but he, yeah i think he's he's really brilliant uh oh brilliant i will check them out on youtube then uh, Alexi is up for talking about his legacy, but always d does it down too much. I love him, but he's grumpy. Oh, so, someone needs to give them all a hug. <laughs> don't, don't see that as an endorsement. You should not go run around giving random eighties alternative comedians hugs. But they, they, they all they they're so down on themselves. It's like you you you're legends. Please have an ego. <laughs> No one else has allowed one. Please have an ego. <laughs> um. So yeah. Um. So yeah. The, I think the best way is to look at this. Look at the best of page, and then find out what's on. Um. Based on that. Uh. Especially if you're not sure, like in terms of location, if it'd be difficult for you to go to um there's a few in london but they're not at the same cinema in london so i went to picture house central which is right uh it's in piccadilly circus i think so it's really really central to london but they've got ones in like hackney and fulham i think yeah fulham road clapham which i think is london isn't it so they're all over the place all over the uh so um in even the ones in london so yeah, definitely look them up and it's it's difficult. It's annoying that you have to do so much to find out where they are and which ones are showing when. Um, especially because, you know, you send the, the link to someone and they just see these dates and you're like, no, no, there's other dates. There's other dates. Um, so, yeah, let me look at this one, for example. Oh, that's just one. I think there's at least two for most of them um let's see there's different combinations of different ones so yeah there's four of bad news in the strike um i'd like to go to an alexi sale one just because i love um didn't you kill my brother i'm um i'm so watching them chronologically pretty much um i watched a few of the series two ones out of order but i've pretty much been watching them chronologically and um so i'm just started series four and i think um out of series out of the one hour ones i think one of my favorites is um alexi sales didn't you kill my brother which is a very if it it feels very much like a, his sandbox especially i mean he did like i said he doesn't appear until series three yeah uh, i think he's in then two episodes i can't remember but if, but if I, as someone who's only just become familiar with his work, it's, it's, it, I know it's written by him, but it's very, very him. It's, um, it feels like this little Brechtian manifesto of his sort of attitude towards life and capitalism and socialism, and but still very funny and um, really entertaining and. Um, there's just something so warm about it. Um, and um, so, uh, so yeah, anyway, thank you so much for watching you guys. I, um, I don't usually get as many views as, as this. Um, it's actually really frustrating because youtube is not working on my desktop at the moment it's not letting me click on like half the things so i wasn't able to turn monetization off on before the stream i might be able to afterwards but i wasn't able to do it before the stream so um uh i will only i don't know if you can make money during the stream apart from donations but um i do have uh super chats and stuff on um i won't be able to withdraw any money from youtube until i make 60 quid and i've made about six quid so far um, but if you want me, if you want to donate to me, it's best to donate to me through Kofi because then I get more of it and the money goes um, like straight into my PayPal. There's a good link to that in the in the description if you donate to me. And that's where I've got some exclusive content. And I'm working on more exclusive content. I want to do book reviews of the comedy books I'm talking about. 
um, like the script book and the Young Ones book and the Mighty Boosh book because I've been reading them and I want to share my thoughts and feelings with you guys. And it's obviously not as easy with uh, a book because um, it's less Fisher Dragon's show, really. <laughs> Um, also, if you want to see how I make these videos, I did a making of video on my monkeys videos, so you can um, have a look at that. Um, so yeah, um, I'm going to be wrapping this up in a minute. Um, I've just got a message from YouTube on Twitter saying they're looking into what the issue is. Um, because I've had this issue on my site since um, Friday when I did my terrible upload. <laughs> so, um, ah, I forgot the final thing I was going to talk about. So, like I said, if, uh, if you're a fan of League of Gentlemen or Inside Number 9, I've done a series about the series series that Steve Pemberton and Rishia Smith did in between called Psychoville, which coincidentally has Dawn French in it um, from the comic strip. So I recommend uh, uh, checking out uh, Psychoville and uh, our um, accompanying my po accompanying uh, podcast as well, um, which will have the interview of the guy who was the former edge of, head of digital comedy at the BBC eventually when I can get round to editing it because it's really annoying and I'm really crap and blah, 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 blah. um anyway but um so George from Headphones UK um has his own channel um um he mainly does sort of animation reviews but he's, he has done reviews of uh, comedy as well he's a big fan of bottom um and he did a review of, um I think about a year ago now of guest house parody so um which kind of included a bit of a bottom retro retrospective it was quite a long review um because he does do he does do some spoiler few kind of reviews as well but he does do those reviews where he, he kind of goes through the whole film but anyway he's just started a podcast which i'm a member of i'm not sure if i'll be able to go to the next episode actually but i did the first episode last sunday um so a few days ago and it was so much fun we're doing watching Dark Crystal Age of Resistance. It's a fantastic fantasy series that got cancelled after one series. Um, in, it's um, a spin-off of the uh, fantasy film um, Dark Crystal, which came out in the 80s, which was directed by Jim Henson. Um, uh, I'm just going to show the... Um, The trailer of that for you now without the sound on yeah so yeah it's a really really brilliant series it's it's like it's visually it's like nothing i've ever seen before um i mean apart from the the, the original film but um, so it's most of the characters are puppets. There are no human characters or animal characters in this at all, apart from, of course, you know, puppet animals. And um, it's uh, in terms of the writing, it's absolutely brilliant. It irons out all of the issues the original film had. And it's, I actually recommend it if you like Avatar, The Last Airbender or Star Wars, The Clone Wars, you know, those fantasy and sci-fi series because i think this is technically space fantasy rather than fantasy because it takes place on another planet with three suns but um it's a really brilliant it like it goes into you know politics and stuff really well and uh, it's got an all-star cast as well which is really surprising um to, to find out who voiced who especially simon Pegg, who voiced the character from the original film and sounds just like him um and it's the most iconic voice from the original film so it was def it definitely would have been the hardest to do so yeah i definitely recommend dark crystal dark crystal age of resistance because um and i recommend listening along uh to the live stream series on his channel it's um it's very good so um uh and yeah i'm gonna have lots more stuff on 80s comedy it's um a big anniversary year for inside number nine and uh league of gentlemen and psychoville so i'm gonna be doing more of that stuff this year 
and they're going to be doing more stuff on 80s comedy like comic strip and uh young ones and stuff like that so do do please um you know feel free to check out my channel and um anyway uh Laura, uh, quickly, if you want, do you have any final thoughts? You can add them now. Um, will there be spoilers in this broadcast? In the, um, oh, there's a comment from Twitter. I don't think I've had one before. In the Dark Crystal one, yes, it's uh, going to be like a watch along kind of podcast. So I'm going, so we're going to be, we're going to watch the episode literally just before we go live. And then we're going to be discussing um, the episode we've just seen. So, um, so yeah, you will need to watch it and then, um, listen to it. Um, so, um, yeah, if you have Netflix, check out the show. Absolutely brilliant. I highly recommend it. Um, so, um, like I said, if anyone has any final thoughts on, uh, The Dark Crystal or on Inside Number Nine or on... Uh, comic strip presents or on motive in the queue which we talked about at the beginning of the the stream uh, i don't think i've ever had 30 people on a stream before thank you so much guys um i mean that meant then again maybe i think that might partially be twitter um so yeah thank let me know if you if you watch this on twitter by the way because um um because yeah i haven't done this very much before and um so yeah, thank you so much, guys. I, I've I've really enjoyed this. I definitely felt more comfortable than the the last one I did by myself. Um, probably because just I had so much to talk about. Um, so I'll probably do one of these again soon. Um, one last question. Well, oh, might not not be the one last. You might welcome to write another one. Um, but uh, Laura says very pleased these comic strip events are happening. There are some fun uh, comic strip fan accounts on TikTok that might be another intro to newbies. I am so happy to hear that because um, I'm not on comic strip on, on TikTok myself. I know um, I know there's a, a growing fandom of League of Gentlemen on TikTok, which is nice because uh, I, you know, it's not my thing. You know, I watch YouTube Shorts, but you know, it's not my thing. But I'm I. However, people discover the show, I'm happy. Um, I mean, and with any of the shows I love, um, I'm just happy that people are discovering it somehow. And people are then because especially a show like Comic Strip Presents, which it like I said, it's kind of underrated and overrated at the same time. It's a show that's kind of people have heard of more than actually seen, I feel. Um, especially modern generations and well, younger generations, what's modern generations just sound a bit weird. But um yeah please check out comic strip presents please go to th these events it broke my heart to see about a, a quarter to a third of the cinema was full guys it broke my heart and for, for it to be the one that had i mean jennifer saunders is arguably the biggest star out of the ones they, they've invited so it was and she that was her only one so it, it did kind of break my heart slightly to see how few people were there because because they do bash their own stuff so much and it is brilliant i'm like no shut the fuck up you're brilliant <laughs> stop being self-deprecating <laughs> you're allowed an ego great stream thanks well thank you so much for all your wonderful comments laura because otherwise this would have been, just felt like me in the void as much as i appreciate you guys watching i i uh, co comments are something that are much easier to engage with and th so thank you to laura thank you to anyone else who commented thanks to you to all of you for watching i love you guys so much i, I really do and um thank you for just giving me this little soapbox to let you know about stuff i love um i'm gonna go before i go all soppy so yeah thank you very much guys i'll see you soon bye I need to, need to end the stream.